And the recording has started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Grant Earl, a board member um, at the Dana Point Historical Society. We're thrilled to welcome you to our presentation tonight um, from Eric Plunkett on St. Junipero Serra and the founders of San Juan Capistrano in Orange County. Um, tonight's broadcast is being recorded. So if you, um, you or anyone you know uh, wasn't able to watch it tonight, we'll be posting this later on our YouTube channel and social, et cetera. Um, if you do have questions, there will be a Q&A period after Eric's presentation when he'll take your questions. You can either type them in the chat window or you'll be able to unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and um, go ahead and ask them in real time. So without further ado, we're thrilled to welcome Eric Plunkett. Eric, take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Grant. Much appreciated. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Plunkett, and it's uh, it's very uh, nice to be here again. I've had the pleasure of speaking to the Dana Point Historical Society on uh, two previous occasions, and it's always uh, it's really really nice to be with you. So, um, without further ado, let's get started with the presentation for tonight. Um, whereas before, I uh, discussed the cliff from which uh, Richard Henry Dana threw the hides down um, uh, at Dana Point and also discussed the Port Talaw expedition with my now, um, uh, unfortunately, my partner, Phil Burgandy, who died in, de in December. Uh, we spoke, um, I believe it was his last speaking engagement when we spoke to the Dana Point Historical Society um, and we had a great time doing it. And uh, so I've covered a lot of the early history of Orange County and right now, uh, I'm going to talk to you about St. Junipero Serra and the founders of San Juan Capistrano and Orange County. So this is a story about the beginnings of the county and really how Serra gets involved in that. And he's become such an important character um, in understanding the early history of California that understanding his time in Orange County specifically uh, can really understand, help us understand the early history of the county. It sets up all the history that came after it. So first, who was Sarah and what was his life up until uh, the point that he came into Alta California? He was born in 1713 um, in Mallorca, Spain, which is an island um, uh, just to the east of Spain. And he became a Franciscan college professor in his 20s and a missionary in Mexico in 1749. Um, he became, uh, was named the father president of the Franciscans in Alta, California. Um, and this was at the beginning of Spanish interest in settling Alta, California. Um, now, Spain had claimed Alta, California since the Carrillo expedition in 1542, but had done little other than have some ships sail along the coast between 1542 and 1769 which is when they finally decided they were gonna settle what is now today, California. And the reason that they finally decided to do so is because they were worried about, you guessed it, those other European powers and Russia, um, about them coming into California and trying to gain some kind of power over it, specifically the British and the Russians. Now, Spain wanted to do this on the cheap, and so one of the ways they did this was by using the Franciscan missionaries. And so for Sarah, the intention was to facilitate the conversion of Indians into Spaniards. And so the Indians who lived in Alta California were gonna be converted into Catholic Spaniards. So Sarah joins the Portola expedition in 1769, comes to Alta California, but he does not go through Orange County. He stops in San Diego. Uh, he waits while the rest of the expedition goes up doesn't find Mont Monterey, they actually do, but they don't know it. They come all the way back down. Sarah's still in San Diego. They second guess and go, wait, maybe that was, was it. And when they march back up, Sarah goes by ship to Monterey. So this is a uh, image of what that ship may have looked like, uh, the San Antonio that he would have taken up um, to, uh, to Monterey, and it was from the sides of this ship that Sarah would have caught his first glimpses of, of what is today Orange County. Um, Saddleback, which was very conspicuous, and of course, all of the coastal um, land, San Joaquin Hills, and of course, Dana Point. 
Okay, now Sarah's first impression of Orange County came from a friend of his, a fellow Franciscan missionary named Father Juan Crespi. Crespi had been on the Portola expedition and had traveled through Orange County um, by this point, by the time uh, Sarah first learns of Orange County, Crespi has been here uh, three times. And the first impression Sarah has of Orange County is of a village called Hutuukna, which is a large Indian village on the Santa Ana River. And you can think about where the 91 and the 55 meet. It's um, uh, in that area, all live, if you know, if you know that part of the county. And it was so impressive to Crespi. Um, there was actually the, ch the chief of that village um, had said, hey, uh, from the Spanish perspective, we need to live together. Um, he actually said to the Spanish, you can help us fight off some of these other Indians who are fighting for our lands. And so for Crespi, this was a perfect site to plan a mission. So Sarah planned Mission San Gabriel to be near Hutuukna on the Santa Ana River um, uh, in 1771. But in Mission in San Gabriel, without Sarah being there, was instead founded on the San Gabriel River. And so it didn't end up getting founded there, but still, Hutuukna formed the first impressions of what Sarah knew of Orange County. Now, this is from Crespi's diary, and it gives you an indication of what, uh, uh, what Sarah would have heard about the Indians living within this county. It says, uh, our Sergeant Ortega and the two of us fathers told them, the Indians of Tuukna, we would come back and when we did, would make a house for the Sergeant and for ourselves and one for God that he might be worshiped by them. And upon our saying this, such tears of joy and happiness sprang to their captain, which is a Spanish word for the village chief, Capitan, uh, sprang to his eyes as touched the hearts of us all. So this to Sarah meant an opening for conversion. And so that's what Sarah knew of Orange County in 1771. Sarah finally does pass through our county uh, in 1772. And he is traveling overland to San Diego from Monterey with the military commander, Lieutenant Pedro Fajes. And he spends two nights in Orange County, the first probably on the Santa Ana River near uh, Olive, and the second probably in San Juan Canyon, the same San Juan Canyon that drains out of Dana Point. But not where Mission San Juan Capistrano is. He's actually quite a bit up uh, canyon because the original El Camino Real um, passed through what is now uh, Gobernadora Canyon, uh, think Cota de Casa. We'll get into that. Um, after seeing the country, he agreed that Mission San Gabriel was founded in a better location. So after Sarah does go through the region, he goes, all right, San Gabriel River is actually a better uh, location for a mission. And we're not totally sure why, but we think it probably has to do with access to, to water and being able to irrigate. Okay, so um, we don't have that many images of, of these guys, these early guys that came through the county. This is one of the best images of Sarah that we have, which is a painting that was commissioned of him uh, shortly after he died. Um, and this right here is Lieutenant Pedro Fajes. It's one of just a couple images that we have. So these, think these guys, when you, you know, this period of time, when I see Pedro Fajes and I see, um, these are the Catalonian volunteers, uh, you think more George Washington. That's the kind of era we're talking about. And uh, the Catalonian volunteers were a group of Spanish um, soldiers who came from the region of Catalonia. Um, and uh, you may know Jose Antonio Yorba the first was a Catalonian volunteer, so he would have had the same kind of blue uniform. And Sarah and them uh, marched together through Orange County on his first visit. Now, after Sarah goes to San Diego, he actually sails back to Mexico, goes to Mexico City, fights to continue to have um, uh, colonization happened in Alta California. The Viceroy agrees, and Sarah returns in April 1774. So Sarah, Sarah travels overland. This is his second time through Orange County from San Diego to Monterey with Father Francisco Garces of the first ANSA expedition, and it was their only meeting. Now, Father Francisco Garces, for anybody who may know him, he is one of the most famous missionaries in all of the Southwest. He was known for taking huge solo journeys through massive parts of the Southwest and uh, living with the Indians while doing so. And so this was Sarah and Garces' only meeting, and it's two of the most important Franciscan missionaries 
in all of uh, the United States history. And this is the only time they were together was in Orange County. The trip was supposed to take three nights in camp, but instead took five nights due to a large storm that they came through in Orange County. Sarah later described the trip as taking six very trying days due to the torrential rains overhead and the mud under our feet. And anybody who's ever seen what happens in our hillsides when it rains, it can turn tiny little canyons into rivers. And so they had a very bad time of it. Now, in 1775, after Sarah returns up to Monterey, he plans the founding of Mission San Juan Capistrano. It wasn't what he wanted. He wanted a mission uh, among the numerous Chumash Indians who were along the Santa Barbara Channel. That's where he wanted to put a mission. But the lack of available soldiers forced him to compromise with the founding of Mission San Juan Capistrano instead. And that was because there were fewer Indians in what is now our county. And the Spanish authorities, military authorities, felt that it was more plausible to set up a mission here where there wouldn't be so many Indians. The Chumash villages were many hundreds of people, whereas the villages here in Orange County were typically uh, more in the little less than 100 to maybe up to uh, 200 territory for the biggest villages. So Mission San Juan Capistrano was founded in October of 1775, but Sarah wasn't part of the founding. He'd sent two other missionaries along to do it, Father Lasuen and Father Amurillo, um, and they founded it up, uh, like I said, up from where the mission is today. The original founding site is up Canyon. If you know the area, think about where Ortega Highway meets Antonio Parkway. It's about just south and west of that was where the original mission was founded. They actually went through the founding ceremonies, but immediately abandoned it because there was an Indian revolt in San Diego that led to the death of one of the missionaries there. And so they said, we just can't risk having soldiers here at San Juan Capistrano. We're going to send all these soldiers back to San Diego and make sure that uh, things are safe there. So to get an image of what this looks like. Um, this is actually the governor of California at the time planning Mission San Juan Capistrano. This is uh, Captain Rivera, um, Fernando Rivera, uh, Imoncada. And this right here is a leather jacket soldier. So these are the primary soldiers who are in Alta California at the time. They have a leather jacket, which is layers of animal skins, which is are used to uh, defend against the arrows, really. They also had a saber, had like a, um, a sword and they had a musket and maybe a short firearm as well. The original mission site, uh, this is a picture about where the mission, original mission site is. It's probably here on the south side of, the, of San Juan Canyon. And like I said, this is up Canyon from where the mission site is today. Um, San Antonio Parkway and, and um, Ortega Highway are somewhere over here where their intersection is. So this is just west of there. Okay. So Sarah goes down to San Diego by ship to reap. And then when he goes down to San Diego, he's there. He receives word that they're going to go back to founding Mission San Juan Capistrano. And this time he's going to be a part of that founding. Um, now, while he's in San Diego, he meets three Indians from the original founding site. Now, just to show you how important that original founding was, that failed founding, the missionaries named three of the Indians who were there, Capistrano, Buenaventura, and Bernardino. Now, all of these Indians had their own Indian names, but they took on these Spanish names as well. And of course, these are three favorite saints that they were named after. And Sarah says very happily, these Indians say that the cross that was put up at the original mission site is still there. And this is a year later, 1776 that the mission's being founded uh, for the second time. And the Indians tell Sarah this cross is still there, everything's still there, and the Indians are ready for them to return. So in Sarah's mind, this is a good sign. So when Sarah does arrive in Orange County, he tours all of the local villages around the area. And this is probably when he would have first visited what is today Dana Point, or he could have. He would have probably gone to the original or the second mission site current mission site, which was a large village named Hachma and uh, uh, Putidam, um, and I'll go over where those villages are. And then he finally refounds the mission on November 1st, 1776. And he's so excited about when it's founded. He actually at a little table in like the little, you know, basically a tent um, uh, there in San Juan Canyon, he writes to the Viceroy. 
and he writes these words. I do not wish to keep your excellency in suspense in regard to the news, which I know will be a source of delight and happiness to you. I wish to inform your excellency that today, November 1st, after the prayers and the blessing of the water, the sight, the cross and the bells, according to custom, I've just finished singing the solemn mass and preaching the usual sermon, which ushered into be being, so to speak, the mission of San Juan Capistrano. It is the handiwork of your excellency and is located in a place called by those born there, Quanis Savit, which is the name of the Indian village, which is partially how we were able to locate where it was, which is now uh, we know is Sahavit would be how it's pronounced. And then Sarah continues, it is midway between San Diego Mission and Mission San Gabriel and on the same spot where last year it had been planned and started. Now, this gives you an, a sense of where things are. I'm, I'm sorry, the map may not be the most uh, uh, high quality. I had to take a screenshot, unfortunately. But this brown line is actually the original El Camino Real that was inland. It did not go along the coast. It was moved along the coast later. So the original mission site is right here next to Sahavit. And it was down canyon from the original um, uh, El Camino Real. Today's mission site is here where San Juan Canyon and Tribuco Canyon meet. But the original mission site was up San Juan Canyon, uh, located right here. And you can see some of these Indian villages in red. Um, Sahavits here, Guiocome, uh, Putiidam, uh, Ahachma, Putiidam is near uh, about Sarah High School. Um, you also had Hulve or Tovuna, um, which was located in Dana Point. It's actually located um, uh, about where the state beach is, and uh, there was a village there. So I'll go more over these villages because they start to play into the story of Sarah's time in Orange County. Okay, now uh, the soldiers, Indian neophytes from Baja, California, and local Indians assist in the constructing uh, construction of the buildings. I should mention the Spanish soldiers brought Indian neophytes. Those were Indians who were already baptized. They were already Catholics. They assisted in the founding of San Juan Capistrano, and they were going to be the ones who corresponded often with the local Indians, teaching them all of the local, uh, skills of an ag agricultural society. Um, and Sarah leaves while they're building the buildings and setting up the site, and he goes to Mission San Gabriel with three soldiers to pick up cattle. And he also attends, intends to bring a translator from Mission San Gabriel to come help with communication down at Orange County, down in Southern Orange County. Uh, this was very exciting for Sarah. It was the first mission founded where they had translators from a neighboring mission. So he felt that this would assist them with the conversion process. So he goes to San Gabriel, he gets these cattle just days after the founding, and then he brings them back to Mission San Juan Capistrano along with the interpreter. Now on their return, Indians in the vicinity of the village of Alauna threatened the cattle. They actually came out on the road, they were painted, they had their bows and arrows in hand, and Sarah really thinks he's gonna die. Now this, is a, this happens just south of Santa Margarita Parkway in O'Neill Park on the flats there, right above Tribugo Creek. And so Sarah's going down, he has one soldier companion with him, Jose Pena and uh, Jose Antonio Pena, and he has the interpreter with him, so the or the translator. So the translator from San Gabriel was unable to understand the Indians who were coming out to meet the cattle and threatening Sarah and the Indians. So the translator says, sorry, Sarah, I don't understand them. So Sarah thinks we're gonna get killed because there's no way we can communicate with these guys. So in a last ditch effort, um, the translator yelled that more soldiers were in the area and would fight back. And so the Indians from Alauna understood him, even if he didn't understand them, and then they backed down. But for Sarah, this was a really important event. And he actually talked to people about it. He talked to his fellow Franciscans about it. And his fellow Franciscan who ended up writing a biography about him, he said this was one of the only times that Sarah thought he was actually going to die and become a martyr. And it happened right there in O'Neill Park. So here's the location of about where that happened. Right here is the original El Camino Real, not the second El Camino Real, but about the first 10 years of Spanish occupation. All of the important Spaniards who were part of the colonization of Alta California walked right through here uh, with Saddleback, Santiago Peak, and Majesca Peak 
um, up there in the distance. And this is also where the village of Alauna uh, was. It was located along the creek in the Oaks. Lots of food there. Um, obviously, there was good hunting. Um, and they came out onto the road and met Sarah and about 80 cat cattle that he was taking down to the mission and threatened his life. And it didn't happen. Sarah returned to San Juan Capistrano and learned, as soon as he returns, he learns that two soldiers and a servant have deserted. So he's already getting frustrated. And then he also learns that one of the soldiers was accused by an Indian captain of the neighboring village of Sahavit of raping his wife. So things are not going well. And an investigation in all matters was carried out by Sergeant Mariano Carrillo, who was of the, of the Port Law expedition. He comes up to San Juan Capistrano and Sarah requests the removal of the accused soldier. And he ends up calling most of the shots. He says, get rid of this guy. He's going to threaten our ability to evangelize among the Indians in here. And so he was removed. Sarah committed himself to other tasks at the time. He directed the construction of the buildings, wrote letters, and wrote the title pages of the mission registers, which are still at the mission today. And from the missionary's perspective, the conversion process at Capistrano went notably well. For the most part, this is because the other missions, it went so poorly. Um, but for the uh, Capistrano uh, missionaries, they thought it went very well. And it's probably because the translator could help. Sarah left the mission to Father Amarillo and Father Mugartegui, who was on his way from San Luis Obispo. And he left it in the hands of, an, of Baja Californians and the soldiers. And some local Indians were already in under instruction. They were going through catechism to be baptized as neophytes into the mission system. So it's all told Sarah was in uh, at the mission for about a, a little over a month um, while during the founding period. And here's one of the, uh, the title pages that he wrote. And you can see um, this is the baptismal register of San Juan Capistrano. And uh, this is in Sarah's hand. But you can notice De Juanes Savit is crossed out by Father Amarillo, who writes De Sahavit. And Amarillo uh, added that in after spending more time here. He realized that Juanes was essentially uh, translating somewhat close to I am from and so he just left the Sahavit, which is the actual name. I, I'm a person of this area, Sahavit. Okay, Sarah continued to be involved with San Juan Capistrano even when he left and went up to Monterey. He requested a painting of St. John of Capistrano. Every mission had its patron saint, uh, patron saint painting, and it was painted by Jose Pais, and it was delivered on the San Antonio, the same ship from the Port Law expedition. Um, and it's still in the Basilica Church today. And so that, that's an interesting part. Uh, Sarah actually said, uh, can you deliver it to Monterey first? I'd love to see it first. And he actually says, hey, look, I know I have a bad name in matters like this, but I'm not going to keep it for myself. I promise I'll send it down to Mission San Juan Capistrano. Um, so it was a painting he was excited about seeing, but he actually didn't get to see it until he visited San Juan Capistrano in 1778. We'll get to that. He also sent a book, the Itinerario, a general guide for missionaries to the mission. And it's also still at the mission today. It's inscribed by Sarah to the mission. Interestingly, it's inscribed twice by Sarah, once to Mission San Juan Capistrano. And the book is also inscribed to Mission San Saba in Texas. Uh, geez, I guess over a decade earlier, Sarah was originally gonna be a missionary in Texas, but because of an Indian uprising there, revolt, um, he didn't end up going. So the book was originally going to go there, but then he reappropriated it for Mission San Juan Capistrano, and it's still at the mission today. During this period, the mission goes through a lot of problems, uh, numerous incidents. Um, in June of 1777, soldiers working with an Indian captain, uh, soldiers were working with an Indian captain to procure women. So that obviously is not going well. Um, and it caused uh, all sorts of issues and friction between the Spanish and the Indians there. And in February 1778, there was a planned Indian revolt. Um, and the 1778 re planned revolt was based off of issues that occurred in June of 1777, which was uh, that actually it, it was pretty bad. There was a um, there were a couple Indians who were stopped on the road on El Camino Real in San Mateo County, uh, Canyon at a village called Alacuachome. And uh, it led to a fight where the Spanish soldiers actually killed three of the Indians in San Mateo Canyon, Canyon um, with their muskets. 
And so it's causing a lot of problems. There's a planned Indian revolt the next uh, February. And that was them trying to get revenge in part for what happened in June 1777 and uh, thereafter. And then also there was a drought. So the first two years at San Juan Capistrano, there's a huge drought and the Indians start blaming the Spanish for being devils in the Spanish eyes. That's what they th thought the Indians were saying. And they said, OK, these guys got to go and we're going to have this planned revolt. But a cook at the mission warns the missionaries and it stops the revolt from occurring. This on the left is the painting of San Juan, uh, St. John of Capistrano, that's still in the Basilica Church today that Sarah asked for. He actually just, he actually asked the artist to paint him with this resolute, um, you know, kind of stoic appearance, which you can see that he has. There's another painting of San Juan, uh, St. John of Capistrano in the Sarah Church at the mission today. And we don't really know the story of this one, but we do know Sarah requested the painting twice by accident. When he first requested this painting, he didn't receive a reply. So then he requests it a second time. And unbeknownst to him, after he sends his second request, it shows up a couple days later. So the second painting of St. John of Capistrano might be a result of him making two requests accidentally. This is the itinerario, the book that's still at Mission San Juan Capistrano today. You can see here, Sarah has appropriated the book Para Ir, in order to go to uh, or to be sent to San Saba, which is the mission uh, that was in Texas. But then the exact same book on the title page, um, you can see it here that Sarah says, uh, Se aplica he, to be applied to mission of San Juan Capistrano uh, de Quanisavit. So Sarah still using that same name. He must have learned it from the Indians who he had already started to get to know, including those three that he had met in. Um, in San Diego the first time. In fact, one of the Indians that he had met in San Diego, who had been named Capistrano, ended up being the first adult baptized at Mission San Juan Capistrano. From his record, we learned that his Indian name was Kutkol. And so Sarah, that was somebody that Sarah knew and he would know every time he went to San Juan Capistrano. And we'll get to that. Anyways, in 1777, Sarah gets that to uh, the mission. And you can see that Amarillo has crossed it out and put Sahabit. Okay, Sarah's fourth time in Orange County. In 1778, Sarah received the authority to confirm neophytes. And so um, this was typically only uh, given to a bishop, but there was no bishop in Alta California, or there was, a, there was technically a bishop, but he was too far away to actually come to California to uh, confirm. And so Sarah goes on a tour of the missions and he sails down to San Diego. Um, and then he is planning to go there in uh, October of 1778, actually for the feast day of St. John Capistrano on the 21st. But anyways, more importantly, San Juan Capistrano has moved. So like I said, those first two years of the mission were hard ones. It was very dry those first two years. So the missionaries there, Father Mugartegui and Father Mamurio, decided to move the mission down canyon from the founding location to where it exists today. And they did this on October 4th, 1778, just two weeks before Sarah got there. You can't help but think that they were a little bit like, hey, before the boss gets here, we better get this done. Um, so it seems that they perhaps finalized that in time for Sarah's visit. When Sarah arrived, numerous children gathered near him without clothes, um, indicating that they were not yet neophytes. And Sarah per uh, personally baptizes 16. Now the mission at that time was just really temporary structures. Um, we think that the south wing of the mission today is about where those structures were located. So Sarah was probably in those buildings, but they've been altered. They've actually been widened. They've had quite a complicated history. And the mission would not have looked the way that we think of it today. They did not have tile. There was no none of that red tile, the brick um, that, you know, Mission Viejo looks like with all that tile everywhere. But um, it did not look like that yet. It would have been poles, tule brush roofs, and that kind of thing. And this is about what it would look like. This is the earliest image in all of Alta California. This is a drawing that was made in 1786 by a French exploration party. And in it, we actually have some interesting characters. This is a uh, Fajes, um, who Sarah first came through Orange County with. Uh, but this is two years after Sarah died. So even after he died, you can see these brush kind of roofs. This is what San Juan Capistrano would have looked like, kind of just scattered buildings. You can see up here there is the start to have the red tile that we know layered the way that it is. 
But there's another interesting thing in this image. The men are separate from the women. And this is how they would have attended church. So this is about what Sarah, maybe the early church would have looked like at San Juan Capistrano, where Sarah would have confirmed. Uh, they probably would have had the bells just up on some temporary wooden poles. And inside the church, the men would be separated from the women. There would be no chairs. So they would have been standing or kneeling, depending on if they're doing prayers. So this kind of gives an image of what things looked like. And once again, you can see that the dress is very late 18th century. Um, like I said, think George Washington, even the hairstyles. Okay, so while Sarah's there, he confirms um, uh, these Indians. And the interesting thing is these confirmations indicate that Sarah was confirming people he knew. In fact, the first baptism was of a uh, uh, child named Harobit, who was Kutkol, Juan Capistrano, one of those Indians that he met in San, in, uh, San Diego, the first Indians from Orange County that he met. It was his brother who he first that he baptizes first. And you can't help but think it's because Sarah knew Kutkol from the founding period and from San Diego. Second baptism was of uh, Thomas Sahut or Bernardino, that was another name that's of one of the first Indians from the area that Sarah met in San Diego. And the fourth was Yigu Yigus, uh, uh, which his name is Buenaventuras, the third name of the Indian that uh, Indians that Sarah first met in San Diego. Capistrano, Bernardino, and Buenaventura were the names of the Indians he met in San Diego prior to the founding. And they had tagged along with this supply train. And here he is baptizing siblings of these guys. And so are these the same that Sarah met before the founding? It seems that they were, at least Cap Juan Capistrano, it seems very likely that it was. So Sarah knew these guys personally, and he wanted to honor them in this way. He ends up spending a week and uh, confirm uh, at the mission and confirms about 146 neophytes. He tours probably all around the area. He almost certainly goes down to Dana Point, but at this point, we think that uh, El Camino Real was still inland. So he would not have come along the ocean, the, the shoreline um, where the Camino Real was later moved. But don't worry, Dana Point uh, is going to come into the story soon. Here is a picture of the baptismal re register that Sarah filled out. So these are Sarah's own, uh, this is his writing of some of the individuals that he uh, baptized. And you can see that this one um, is, uh, this one is, uh, Ladislao. This is the, the guy whose brother is Juan de Capistrano. So who's a neophyte already uh, at the mission. And so this we think is the first Indian that Sarah met in San Diego, uh, who's from Orange County. And they're from the village of Uhunga. And Uhunga is about located where Cota de Casa is. So that's where they uh, they were from. And these are vestments that Sarah may have worn at the time. Uh, and they're still in the collection of San Juan Capistrano Mission. Okay, Sarah's involvement in the mission between 1778 and 1783. So we're just going to go right in chronological order. There was a new governor, Governor Neve, and he made sweeping changes in Alta California. And uh, he starts to move focus away from the missions, move focus instead to Pueblos. This is when San Jose, the Pueblo, is um, established and when Los Angeles is established. So they want to try to have this alternate form of settlement. Um, and then San Juan Capistrano starts supplying food for the soldiers at San Diego. And San Juan Capistrano made significant developments agriculturally, wheat, beans, and wine. And I should mention this, that we think that the very first wine produced at all in Alta California was produced at San Juan Capistrano. They were uh, grapes that Sarah had ordered from Baja, California. And uh, we think that they were planted in 1778 when they moved to the new site mission site. And then it takes about three years to maybe produce your first batches of wine or so. And so we think by the time Sarah last visits the mission in 1783, that he would have been drinking wine made right there at San Juan Capistrano. And also they build today's Sarah Chapel, which of course has been altered a lot, but the foundations and, the, and most, a lot of the walls are still the same. And Sarah had to shuffle around missionaries during this period to found another mission. He was always interested in finding mission, uh, founding missions. He finally founds a mission on the Santa Barbara Channel, Mission Santa Buenaventura. Um, 
and I should say Samson. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I said, okay, I wrote that right. Uh, and he leaves Mugartegi alone for a time at Capistrano. So it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting story. He pulls one of the missionaries. There are usually two at a mission. He pulls one of the missionaries to found San Buenaventura and leaves only one missionary at San Juan Capistrano. And Mugartegi gets so upset about this. He writes to Sarah and says, I'm going to leave. I'm going to give the place up. So this is still very ad hoc. It's a mission that's kind of only hanging on by a thread. There's not a lot of Spanish people who are uh, making it run. So Sarah's last time in Orange County. He comes here in 1783 in October. Once, ag uh, once again, he's going on a confirmation tour. He knows it's his last journey because he feels like he has failing health. He sails down to San Diego and then he takes the new El Camino Real. We really think that he did this based off of the villages that um, were showing baptisms at the time, which were along the coast. Villages like Uchme at Las Flores and Panje, which is at the uh, mouth of San Mateo Canyon. Um, and so he would have gone along the coast, right along Capistrano Beach. He would have gone just south of Dana Point. And then when he arrives, he's shown around the mission for a couple of days and then confirms 90 children before confirming the rest of the neophytes over the following days. Now, Sarah loved seafood. He's from Mallorca. He lived in Palma. He loved seafood. We know from the early records, I have all the letters from the time and the reports, the soldiers learned very quickly that the fishing at Dana Point was really good. And so they were doing a lot of it. And Sarah would have eaten uh, the seafood from the area and he would have drank the wine probably that was produced there. And so he would have been spending time in this area and in Dana Point. And just to have you remember this, this green dashed line is what the later El Camino Real was. And this is where we think that he went, which would have turned right around the corner there, um, east or south of Dana Point uh, to head up Canyon to the current mission site. And here's uh, one of the things he wrote here, which is on display at the mission today. And he's talking about on the 12th of October, Sunday, he's baptizing. Um, and uh, he still calls the mission Qantas Savit, which is kind of interesting because we know that the village that the mission was moved to was Ahachma. And so he's still using Sahavit, and I don't know why that is, but he seems to stick with that name. I think he just keeps the same name. Also, it's interesting that his fellow missionaries didn't correct him and say, you don't need the Qantas, or, uh, but they didn't. So this is something that he wrote that he was here. You can see he confirms 221, which is all of the neophytes, all of the baptized Indians who are at the mission. Okay, what's Sarah's legacy in Mission San Juan Capistrano and in Orange County? So Sarah was the guy who originally assigned Father Fuster to San Juan Capistrano. Now, Fuster ends up becoming one of the most important missionaries at the mission. He is the main thrust behind the Great Stone Church. Um, he, uh, his name can actually be seen on one of the main mission bells. You can see it in where the uh, bell tower was of the uh, Great Stone Church. Sarah was the one who put him there. And of course, as Franciscans, they were interested in building churches. And so Fuster ends up build, uh, being the main thrust behind um, the building of that uh, Greystone Church. Fuster's buried at the mission. In fact, he died while the uh, Greystone Church was in uh, construction under construction. His, uh, he was buried underneath the Sarah Chapel or Sarah Church. He was moved to, um, uh, to the Greystone Church and then he was uh, after the Great Stone Church fell, he was once again moved underneath, just in front of the stairs uh, in the Sarah Church today. And the Sarah Church itself is very historic. We know that it was probably made, it was probably first finished 1781, 1782-ish. And uh, we know that was when it was first completed. Um, based off of the measurements of the church, it, there is this conspicuous crack in the middle of the wall. But it looks like actually the length of what it is today was how long it was when it was first built. And Sarah did confirm, as far as we know, inside of its walls. And so that's why uh, Mission San Juan Capistrano has this distinction of being the only mission that has a church where Sarah um, uh, actually said mass and confirmed. And in fact, after the Sarah Church was not in use anymore because the Great Stone Church became the main church on the, on the property, 
um, the Sarah church became a warehouse. And then after the great stone church fell, it was converted back into a church. But Sarah's name, of course, adorned schools and streets. He has a big legacy in the county. And in Sarah's mind, he sincerely believed he was doing good for the Indians temporarily and spiritually. You have to remember, Sarah was born in 1713 on an island in Spain. His whole worldview was entirely Catholic. He really believed that if he did not participate in this effort of converting the souls of the Indians to Catholicism, that they were going to uh, be eternally lost. So he was motivated by this. If you read his letters, he's sincerely interested in doing this. His slice of time in Orange County was very demanding yet short. He only spent over a little over two months in the county total, although he had a lot to do with it in between. Um, and his future vision of today's Orange County failed to come fruition. What Sarah envisioned was that the mission would become a village that was owned, the surrounding lands would be owned by the Indians. That's what he anticipated. That's what he wanted to happen. He fought against the idea of Spanish soldiers or their family, their descendants, uh, getting ranchos. He had already seen that happen at his time, during his time as a missionary in Mexico. He was worried about that happening here. Um, and in fact, he promoted things like soldier and Indian marriages, especially when there weren't a lot of Indian women or a lot of uh, Spanish women in the province at the beginning. He promoted this. And San Juan Capistrano had three marriages between soldiers and local Indians. And two of those have descendants today. And Sarah saw that kind of mixture far more as the as what would become future Orange County than what it did become, which is essentially you had a kind of uh, the landowning class, and then you had the Indians often working as uh, uh, laborers. Now, the Indians' perspective, just to put it in here, including Juan Capistrano, right, Kutkol, um, and Buenaventura, and uh, all those other Indians who became neophytes at the mission, was completely different than the Spanish. Their responses were varied, but I think the main thing we've got to know is that they were united, united in strategies that allowed them to persevere to today. And they did, and they are here today. Many of their descendants are here today. And they are the ones, their ancestors are the primary builders of Mission San Juan Capistrano. Now the Indians here knew Sarah. Um, uh, and they, uh, the ones that he knew uh, confirm, and confirmed built the mission we know today. In fact, three died in the Great Stone Church when it fell. Three of the Indians he confirmed died in the Great Stone Church. And some lived as late as the 1840s. Indians that knew Sarah lived as late as the 1840s, long after Sarah died in 1786. In fact, one of them that lived uh, uh, well after um, was Yigu Yigu, who was um, Buenaventura. We think he may have been one of these first Indians that Sarah met in San Diego before the founding. He ends up being married in the Sarah Chapel, this Indian does, right? Yigu Yigu is his Indian name. And uh, while his wife and him never had children, he uh, later, later had a child out of wedlock, a daughter, who died at about the age of six in 1806, possibly during the measles outbreak. So, but he still lives at the mission. A month later, he was, while he was in the midst of grieving, he attended the ceremonies accompanying the completion of the Great Stone Church. So this Indian who knew Sarah is there when the church is dedicated. He continues to live at the mission. He's there when the Great Stone Church falls. He's there in 1818 when Bouchard takes over the, the mission uh, for, for a brief period of time. Um, he's there through the 1820s. He's there when the mission is secularized in 1833. He was still living at the mission, an Indian who knew Sarah, when Dana was throwing the hides off the top of the cliff in 1835. And he finally dies in 1836. So it's just interesting to think about Sarah having an impact on Indians who ended up spanning their lifetime the entire span of the mission era. And that was the story of Yigu Yigu of Buenaventura. Okay, here's one last document to show you that's quite interesting. This document is give a woman who is giving permission. Her name, um, uh, uh, well, her, her Indian name 
is, um, and I just forgot what it was, Alam, there it is. Uh, her Indian name is Alam, and she is one of the Indians who marries a Spanish soldier at San Juan Capistrano, a marriage that Sarah promoted. And she ends up way outliving her husband, uh, whose name was Pio Quinto Zuniga. And at the time, parents had to give consent for their children to get married. Now, this is a woman who was about 14 when San Juan Capistrano is finally founded. She lived in what is today Las Flores. Um, you guys might know that if you go down uh, south of San Clemente, um, Las Pulgas, off ramp. That was where she grew up as an Indian at the village there. She marries a Spanish soldier. They have a bunch of kids together. And here she is giving consent in 1825. This is a woman who knew Sarah, who Sarah confirmed. She doesn't know how to write, so she makes the sign of the cross. And so this is just to show you that those Indians have their own story. And so this is a woman who knew Sarah, and here she is giving consent for her husband or her kid to get married because her husband is deceased. Okay, um, thank you, everybody. I know there was a lot of information there, and I really appreciate you uh, being here. I really do. It's always nice to share this with other people. If you have further interest, I know it went out on the um, uh, promotional information for this talk. Uh, you can visit my website, visionsofcalifornia.blogspot.com. I've just finished a book on Sarah's time in Orange County. It's really long and it's very detailed and uh, I look forward to putting it out, but I put a small section of it up on my um, blog. You can see there, it doesn't have footnotes, but it gives you an idea of what the book's going to be like and it covers the time of the founding. And I've had a lot of help and I feel like I have to say uh, thanks to all these people who've helped me, Dr. Rosemary Beebe and Dr. Robert Senkovitz, two of the greats in um, California history, early California history, uh, David Rex Galindo, um, Doc, uh, Reverend William Kreckelberg, you might know him from San Juan Capistrano. He's been helping me a lot. Stephanie George, Chris Jepson, the Orange County Historical Society. And my friend Phil Brigandi, who, like I said, passed in December. And we had the pleasure of speaking to you all about the Port of Law expedition last year. And uh, I miss him dearly, but uh, he got me started on this project. So um, I, I've, I've got to give him a little shout out. All right. So at this point, um, I am willing to take questions. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, type them into the chat and then Grant can forward them to me or I can see the chat too. Yeah, thank you so much, Eric. Um, like Eric said, please feel free to type your questions in. You can use the raise hand function and um, we can call on you and you can unmute yourself, but uh, yeah, um, fascinating topic. And I'm sure that there are plenty of questions out there. Thank you very much, Grant, appreciate that. And I see that Barbara, um, our president was able to join. Barbara, maybe you wanna say a few words as well while we're waiting for questions. Can you hear I me? My camera's not on. There we go. We sure can. Oh, Hi, good. Barbara. Hi, Grant. Grant, I want to thank you so much for putting this together today. And due to technological difficulties, <laughs> I was late. I got in just as uh, Eric finished introducing himself. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you saw the, the, the presentation. <laughs> it's always good to see you, Barbara. <laughs> and uh, that was after um, I had written up what I wanted to say about you. But you really have been a friend to the Dana Point Historical Society, and we've enjoyed each of your talks. So the one on um, uh, Dana to start yeah. with and the location where he and other sailors uh, threw the hides off the bluff. Yep. And then uh, again with you and Phil, and we were so lucky to have you and Phil October of last year because he, it wasn't too long thereafter that we lost him. That's right. So, um, so you were saying that it was your experience writing the Portola um, expedition that brought you to do this research on um, Saint Sarah or Father Sarah. Yeah. 
It is. Um, you know, the, the stories connect so well. And uh, Phil and I were in the process of uh, writing a book on the Portola expedition for the university press. And um, so uh, we were doing research on that. And while I was doing research on that, just kept running into more and more of the story of Sarah and what his story was in Orange County. And that uncovered all of these other stories. So that was kind of the, the gateway into all of this. So it, taking the long view of Father Sarah, which of yeah. course some people aren't doing these days, yeah. they, they're kind of reacting to um, based on today's values. Um, how do you feel about Sarah? It's a great question. I think to understand Sarah, we've got to stop thinking of him as the entire, the, the only person who represents an era in time. Mm -hmm. This was 250 years ago, and it was a very, very different time. And Sarah grew up in a society where really it comes down to this. The, uh, the founders of the United States were far more willing to say, if the Indians are an inconvenience, we're going to move them away so that we can use these lands for agricultural pursuits. The Spanish had a completely different approach. They had to. Spain had been, essentially been granted all of the lands in the Americas, except for a small part of Brazil following mm -hmm. Columbus's, uh, Columbus's voyage. So they didn't have enough population to emigrate into the Americas to claim them in the, in the, for, as lands of Spain. Mm -hmm. So they had to go through this process of conversion, converting the Indians to Spanish citizens, and that was their method of ensuring that these lands became part of Spain. Sarah was participating in that idea that we would convert these Indians over, they would become Spanish citizens, great. Now, I think that the thing that's getting lost in all of this debate is that within Spanish society, there was huge disagreement about how to do this. Sarah, compared to a lot of his fellow countrymen, was more concerned about the Indians continuing to own their lands. He was fighting for that. Now, that doesn't mean that by today's standards, what he was doing was right, but we shouldn't judge somebody in the 1770s and 1780s by today's standards. Compared to the times he was living in, he was more benevolent than a lot of his fellow countrymen were wanting to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and one other question before I don't want to take up everybody's time, but, um, how do we go ahead and get your book when it's ready? Oh, that's, that'd be great. I, I'm in the process of just getting some image permissions. I need to get, you know, image permissions from Mexico city and some from Czechoslovakia, um, if you can believe it. Uh, and so I'm in a process of doing that. Once that's done, I'm going to start, um, uh, I'm going to push it over. And Barbara, I will definitely email you and the Dana Point Historical Society Board um, and let you know that it's out and get you a copy. Um, because you, as much as you're saying I've been kind to you, uh, you've all been very kind to me and giving me a platform to talk about these topics. Well, great. We'll look forward to that. Great. Well, I see a question how did fishing work? Were there boats involved, nets, poles, swimming? Um, were the methods coming from Spaniards or locals and how much of the diet was fish? Okay, uh, pre-Spanish, the Indian villages along the coast were almost always in this area, Southern California, larger than the villages that were inland. Generally, that was the case. And that was because the villages along the coast had access to marine resources, including food, um, and uh, they were using a variety of techniques. They would actually use shells uh, as hooks, and uh, they would actually use twine uh, um, based off of plants that they could use little ropes to catch them. They had all sorts of, uh, you know, they would make little dams uh, to get the fish to go in that they couldn't get out of. You can see some of that stuff on display at the mission. Um, now, when the Spanish got here, the Spanish... <laughs> you know, if they were smart, they, they don't talk about this in the historical record. So I'm surmising that they probably would have used the techniques that the Indians were using. Right from the beginning, the Spanish soldiers are interacting with the Indians a lot. And so um, uh, if they had any sense, they would have 
uh, benefited from their years of expertise. But of course, the Spanish themselves were no strangers to this. Um, so they would have had their own fishing techniques. And I'm sure there would have been a blend. As far as boats go, it it's hard to say it would have been necessary to have boats, maybe small rafts or something that they would have taken out. But I think that they probably could have gotten enough just from shore fishing. All right. And I hope that was sufficient. Any other questions? Yes, Richard Gardner, go ahead. I don't know if he can type it in or speak. I'm un unmuted now, I think. Oh, there you go. Yeah, um, I, I heard something that I wonder if you've ever run across. Um, that Father Unipera was a very short man. Yes. Um, and probably just over five feet. And he also had had a either a sting or a bite or something on his foot so right. that early on he had a it had swollen and it had always been a limp he had a and and yet at the same time i read that he here he well he walked all the way to san francisco <laughs> yeah you know? so that, that that's a great point um Yes, he had a leg that uh, he, okay, when he gets to Mexico in 1749 to become a missionary, he's very much into penance. He wants to, he wants to self, you know, demonstrate that he is devoted to God. So instead of going by horse or by carriage, actually at the time, Franciscans weren't supposed to take horses. So they would ride mules as a workaround. But anyways, he walked from Veracruz to Mexico City. And in the process of doing so, he got a bite on his leg. What we think later is that he had a um, he had an ulcerous leg. It made travel very difficult for him. We know by the early 1770s he was willing to take carriages. He took a carriage into Mexico City uh, when he visits there in 1773, um, and uh, so we know he's probably riding on muleback uh, at the times that he's traveling up and down the province um, overland. So. It's doubtful that he was walking. His main bio, one of his main biographers surmises that he would have not been walking by that point, by the time he was in Alta California. But uh, still, he was very much into self-sacrifice. And anybody who's studying him knows that he was into the disciplina. He would, uh, he would, you know, beat his chest with a rock um, uh, during during uh, sermons. Um, in fact, a lot of his fellow Franciscans and fellow countrymen were worried about how much he would show penance. So, yes, and he was also a frail man from a very early age. He was a very frail man. In fact, when he first tried to enter in as a Franciscan in the convent, he uh, was denied because the, the, the leader thought he was too young because he was too small. He actually had to get his birth certificate before saying, OK, all right, he's, he's the right age. He can get in. <laughs> um, all right. So thank you, Richard. I appreciate that question. It's very good. I really uh, enjoy it. Yeah, Jeff Huston, um, you asked, could you please Houston. discuss? Oh, Houston, I apologize. Jeff Houston, could you please discuss the earthquake killing neophytes inside the church? Yeah, so Sarah, uh, just to relate to Sarah's story, Sarah's last at San Juan Capistrano in 1783. The Great Stone Church is started in 1797. It's completed in 1806. It falls on December 8th, 1812. So it's around about six years, three months. Um, and the earthquake that occurred, based on what we can figure out about it, it probably occurred in the San Gabriel Mountains, eastern San Gabriel Mountains, perhaps near Cajon Pass or Wrightwood. You know, you have the San Andreas Fault going right through Wrightwood. It was, uh, it was not necessarily a large earthquake. One of the things here, I am also writing a book about the Great Stone Church. Um, one of the things to keep in mind here is that the church is made of stone but it was directed by a mason who was brought to San Juan Capistrano from Culiacan in Mexico. Um, Isidro Aguilar was his name. And uh, he dies while the church is being made, probably in late 1802, early 1803. And uh, we know by that point that the dome that still exists today and the big dome that did exist until the 1860s, um, uh, 
those were already made. So the portion that we think was made after his death was the bell tower, which may have been made of a lower quality. And the bell tower actually sways twice. There's a first earthquake. There's, uh, uh, we know that uh, um, Father Barona, who was giving, he was actually saying mass at the time of the earthquake. It was the morning mass. Um, and uh, there's the first earthquake. We know that he says, come through the door, the door into the sacristy. And, um, and before he gets finished saying it, the second earthquake happens and the bell tower falls on the portal, the entrance to the church. It actually falls south towards the plaza, falls onto that portal. And when it does, the portal coming down brings down three of the domes all the way to the transept. And we think that the Indians who are trying to escape out the side door uh, that's where they uh, got crushed by the rocks above. And so 40 Indian fights died. Well, actually, two of them died in the bell tower, two boys who were up there. And they had already been up there because, and I, this is research I haven't shared with anybody, but it was at the end of mass. And the two boys were up in the bell tower about to ring the bells for the end of mass. And so they ended up perishing too. And there's a lot more to that story, but you'll have to read my book one day when I finally get it done. <laughs> Hopefully that answered your uh, your question, Jeff. All right. Well, we are a few minutes over our our hour that uh, you were able to give us, Eric. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and uh, we'll end the meeting. Um, any last uh, words from Barbara or Eric? Uh, 